Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on fall protection in the entertainment industry with uh, Nick Creech from Harkin Industrial. Um, just before I hand over to Nick and let him take it away, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, the next session after this will be on Zoom uh, Stream B, which is insights from our returning global industry practitioners with David Eversfield, uh, Alistair Cameron and Natalie Braid. And that starts at 11 o'clock. Um, remember our lobby space is open all day for to hang out, network and continue conversations. If you've got any questions and answer, uh, questions for Nick in this session, just pop them in the Q&A chat um, and we will live in your mic and let you ask, ask your question. Um, if you want to have more conversation, as I said, take it over to the lobby and carry on the discussion later on. The trade show passport is returning. Um, all, all conference delegates have access to the entry form. The completed entries will go into the draw for prizes being uh, contributed by the exhibitors and the link is in the, uh, in the chat for all these sessions. Um, a few thank yous. Thanks to Multimedia Systems and Verlo for making the whole conference go online, to the executive committee and organizing committee of the conference to for all their tireless work, all of our presenters and speakers that we've had on board for, this, uh, for uh, these two days of conference. Um, our trade show exhibitors, including Aspiring Safety, Fiasco, Jans New Zealand, John Herber, Kinderdine Entertainment Lighting, Alice Group, MDR Sound and Lighting, Metro Productions, Scenic Solutions, Showquip, Show Technology, Stage Mark, Theatre Light, and ULA Group. And for the suppliers that were supporting the physical conference before we went online, Production Transport Services, Grouse, Metro, Sugar Sisters, Tafire, Fox Glove, Southern Cross, Strongback Crewing, and Hire Master. Um, so I'd like to welcome Nick Creech from Harkin Industrial. Nick has a long history in production and entertainment rigging um, and human performance um, and with Cirque du Soleil and around New Zealand and the world. And he's going to have a chat to you about fall protection. Welcome, Nick. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for organising this. I know that switching from uh, in real life to online is a bit of a challenge. So I <clears throat> appreciate all the work that's gone on there. And thanks, everyone, who's come along to listen to me talk about fall protection. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and put on a PowerPoint to start with. So it was originally supposed to be a 45 minute presentation. It's gonna be a half hour presentation online now. So it's been a bit changed um, to make it a bit more into this, uh, this time frame. So <clears throat> if anyone, out there does know me, then you're going to hear about me some more. And if you don't, then I'm going to give you a bit of a background about who I am and why I guess you should listen to me. Um, beautiful photo over there. I've been working at Heights since 2000, early 2000s. Um, I went to circus school back in the day, which is how I ended up getting into entertainment. Um, since then, I've worked in rope access, construction, circus, theatre, rock and roll, and I've been responsible for people working at height as a head rigger, production manager, project manager, technical director, fall protection and rescue trainer. I've dealt with all these governing bodies and I've rigged all over the world. <clears throat> um, through all of that, I've ended up with imposter syndrome every once in a while, wondering how I got into the positions that I got into. Um, and it's only once I've started explaining those techniques and and I guess seeing the passion that I have for all of these different things that it reminds me, you know what, I actually know what I'm talking about. Um, all of these things that I've been doing, <clears throat> how did they contribute to me knowing what I do and being good at it? Well, rope access stuff. Uh, a lot of people ask me if I'm gonna, is it worth getting a rope access qualification to work in the entertainment industry? It's definitely not something that's necessary, but it's useful. It's one of those things that's another feather in your uh, in your bow. Um, so the more things like that you have, the, the better skills you've got to be able to solve problems. Um, construction taught me how to, I guess, put things together, the welding, the inspection side of it. Um, circus has been a massive part of my life. I started working for Cirque du Soleil in 2008. Um, went off on tour with them as a rigger, then a head rigger, um, and then project manager and then most recently running full protection and rescue training until COVID happened <clears throat> and I needed to look for a job and ended up working for Harkin Industrial which is an exciting new place to be. Um, what makes it exciting is that I get to play with new cool toys and anyone in rigging knows that cool toys are what we love. Um, so these are all the things that have meant that I guess I'm good at what I do and why I got asked to be here. Um, 
what this talk isn't about. <clears throat> it's not a substitution for a full protection class. It's not about the hierarchy of control. I'm assuming that you've already exhausted this if you're at the point of working at height. And it's definitely not about what you can clip to because the engineering and what things are rated for is such a massive topic that if we got into that now, um, you know, it'd be hours later and we'd end up having to call in all these other people to talk about it because it's a massive thing. So we're going to assume, we're going to assume that those things have been talked about um, and, and dealt with prior to, to us getting to this point. Um, I'm going to start by playing a video because I think there's one, there's something that I think is really important to see, which is what happens when you fall. I'm going to share a screen. See if you guys can see this. This is a fireman doing a, a four. So a factor one four. Currently, we've just got your PowerPoint still. No. Oh, oh, sorry. There we go. Yep, we cool. that. So it's a company called Gravitec, based out of the States. Still a bunch of cool testing. This is what it looks like when someone is prepared for a fall. Someone whose job it is to take risks. So this is the ideal situation. His harness goes slack. He prepares himself. You can imagine what he's thinking right now, and he's prepared for this. The shock absorber starts deploying, and it slows him down. Look at the guy's face. This is what it looks like in real speed. <clears throat> I think it's really important to understand that this is the best case scenario of a worst case situation. Right, going to. Uh -oh. Stop sharing and go back to my PowerPoint. Excuse me for a second. Perfect. So, what have I learned over the years about fall protection? First thing is making it easy. If you make it hard for people to follow procedures and rules, they're not going to do it. And how do you do that? You need to get people engaged and you need to get people to buy into what you're trying to implement. Um, there needs to be accountability. People need to know, A, the, what, what it's going to cost the company if you're a company person. Um, what it's going to cost the individual, and this isn't the monetary cost, it's, you know, what it's going to do to the whole industry if someone falls. Uh, it's understanding all the different parts that make a, make why we want to use full protection, um, why, why we want to make, use full protection. We want to go home at the end of the day. Um, and if you make a mistake is what you can do to, to I guess, I mean, it's accountability. You want to make people understand why it's important to do it. Um, the, one of the other things is why we need to train often, and this is in your teams or with your the people, your colleagues, is train using it. And training is every time you use it. Um, giving people feedback. Don't be too sensitive if people give you feedback about how to use stuff and ask questions about it. Because it's all, without asking questions and without people looking critically at how we move and do things, um, we don't ever learn. So giving and receiving feedback is super important. Don't get cocky. Um, most accidents happen when people are getting cocky. And most of these things happen when you've done it a million times and you become complacent. Um, don't be a dick. <laughs> Should be the first rule, actually. Uh, <clears throat> don't be a dick if someone's giving you advice. If, if someone's trying to give you advice in a full protection um, environment, take it as they actually care enough to want to make sure that you're okay. Um, don't be too sensitive about it. Maybe they're not the best at giving information to someone. And if that's the case, then you know you can talk about with them after uh, how they delivered that. Um, don't be lazy. All too often you see people climbing and they're doing it the, the quickest way, but they're not thinking about what's going to happen if they fall. Um, and wait, let me move my head. 
ask questions, but please make sure you think first. There's nothing worse than people asking questions for something they haven't thought about. Um, and that goes into don't be lazy as well. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with my list of pet peeves because I figure it would be a good place to start. No rescue plans. If someone's going to be climbing, the, the first question you should ask is, do I have a rescue plan? If you don't, then the person shouldn't be climbing. Um, people not using shock absorbing lanyards correctly. Screw gate carabiners and full protection. Doing the bare minimum, which is both employees and employers and subbies as well. People not reading the instructions. There's so much information and instructions out there at the moment. Um, most manufacturers have got extremely exhaustive examples uh, in their instructions about what their gear can be used for. So familiarize yourself with them because there's just a wealth of information in there. Um, cow's tails is full protection. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, the New Zealand and Australian standards for full protection. We're going to get into that as well. Badly designed harnesses and ill-fitting harnesses. Um, and to tie, tie in with screw gate carabiners, the non-ANSI Z359.12 rated carabiners. So it's the strength of the gate. One of the last things that kind of irks me is being charged full price for a harness when it's been sitting on the shelf in the shop for years. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about harnesses, buying harnesses, and uh, what to look for. Rescue plans. <clears throat> someone should only climb if there's someone there to rescue you. So that person who's going to do the rescuing should be trained in this, and they should practice it regularly. Um, they should also know that it's expected of them because all too often people will go, oh, that, that person's in the building, um, so they'll rescue me. But they might not know that. They might have another plan. They might have other focuses. So at least letting someone know that you're expecting that is, is really key. Um, making sure that the rescue equipment is somewhere where everyone knows that it is and it needs to be checked regularly. Um, and the last one is practice, practice, practice. <laughs> This picture is of a big top rescue um, uh, at Cirque du Soleil. Um, so we needed to train getting someone down off the big top. So to do it on the big top is a massive, it's a big setup, which means there can be no one inside uh, doing any rehearsing because we bounce around on the big top. So what we would do would be set up a mini version of that uh, in an environment where we could see every part of it. Uh, and that would take, you know, less than, 15 minutes, or well, you could do a training session in, in half an hour and everyone would have a go at playing all aspects of it. Whereas if we set that up on the big top, um, we'd be in a situation where uh, <clears throat> maybe in an hour we could get two or three people through every part of that. So figuring out ways to get little bits of training done um, at times when there's maybe some downtime during a show or in the shop, is, is a really good way to get people to familiarize themselves with the different bits of equipment. And the more familiar you are with the equipment, uh, the better you're going to be at using it, and the better you're going to be at using it, the safer and more efficiently you're going to be able to carry out a rescue. Um, but if there's no one there to rescue you, you shouldn't be climbing, is the, is the bottom line. So it's a really, really, really important one to do. Um, we're not going to go into building rescue plans. Uh, if that's something you want to talk about ever, please get in touch with me because I love making rescue plans. Another thing, why lanyards? Redundancy. <clears throat> so here's a couple of pictures. Um, we're just going to look at them in the sense of the one on the left clip to the horizontal and the one on the main cord of the truss. So when I talk about redundancy, I'm talking about let's think of the worst case situation where one of these things breaks. And the picture on the left is a horizontal of a piece of vertical truss. So if that broke, what's going to happen? That piece of fall protection equipment's just going to you know, end up in free fall. The one on the right, although we're more side loading the connector, if that breaks, it's going to go down to the next one, which is then going to have to break. So we're giving ourselves a little bit of redundancy in our fall protection. Um, Redundancy is a really big one if you're working in situations where things are variable. Uh, I've got questions. No. Are screw gates required and triact inappropriate for 4 Pro? We were totally going to get into this. 
give me a few minutes and we're going to talk lots about that sort of thing. Um, so redundancy, thinking about how we use our fall protection. Thinking about clipping high and reducing your free fall distances. These are a couple of pretty bad photos I took in my garage this morning. Um, photo on the left, you can see that the, the shock absorbing lanyard is clipped on the other side of the piece of truss. So if we're working on a piece of truss and we clip to the top cord, like is on the picture on the right, you can see how much further down the shock absorber starts to go before it will deploy. That's going to mean that you're going to have a larger free fall distance, which means you're going to be creating more forces, which means you're going to end up hanging further below what you're going to be clipping into. So thinking about what you're doing when you're clipping, where you're clipping to, is all going to help maximize your chance of being in the best situation if you do fall. If you're climbing up something vertical is when you get to a point where you're going to work is to clip your shock absorbing lanyard as high as possible and go back down and work. It will mean that you're almost working in a full restraint uh, situation. If you do fall, there's going to be very little distance of a free fall. And I think that's really important. Here we go. We want rated gates, 16 kilonewtons. This is what we should all be asking for in, <coughs> in full protection. So this is kind of getting into the, oh, here we go. The person giving the safety briefing is in your view, not doing the best job. Don't be a dick and interrupt. Listen to what they have to say. Constructively add to the briefing at the end of, in a polite way. Say what you wish to add without putting the person down. Maybe a chat with them after, especially if they do not know you or your background. You may, may both learn from each other, share the knowledge. Okay, that's a question from Peter Mansell. Um, yeah, definitely. Be constructive with your feedback. Uh, actually, that's a line from Flight of the Concords. Um, be constructive with your feedback. <laughs> One of their songs has this. Uh, putting people down never gets a buy-in. Uh, and feeling when people are doing a briefing in that situation, um, most people already feel a little bit sensitive about it or a little bit shy about doing a briefing. So if you've got something to add in, try and do it in the most respectful way. It's all about making information accessible and palatable so the nicer you can be and the more respectful you can be about um, maybe correcting or adding in and especially briefing uh, style situations um, the more the better received it will be um, thanks peter for that so why non-rated gate carabiners and screw gate carabiners have no place in modern fall protection because there's better options so it used to be that all of the stuff that we use for fall protection was carried over from rock climbing. Um, when I first started out climbing, uh, working, sorry, it was my first proper rigging gig was Red Hot Chili Peppers in, in Christchurch back in early 2000s. Um, the head rigger at the circus school asked if I wanted to go do some rigging. And I thought, yeah, sure. I said it's for Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm like, perfect. We're going to pay you this much an hour, even better. What do I need? Okay, you need a harness and some rope. And I was like, sure. So I took my rock climbing harness and a couple of little slings and my dynamic rock climbing rope. And I went and climbed around a roof for a day. And it was a massive, massive learning experience. And it was very much thrown in the deep end. Um, looking back at that now, there's, you know, obviously pulling points with a dynamic rope is uh, not the most fun thing to do. Climbing around in a rock climbing harness with some pretty static, uh, things clipped on if I fall is, is, is not very good. But that was the reality back in the day. But we're not there anymore. Um, fall protection has evolved and we should be evolving with it and trying to uh, look around and see what the best option is, not just the one that's adequate. Um, so we're going to talk about rated gates. <clears throat> so there was a new standard that came out in the States, uh, NCC 359.12, uh, 2012 when it came out first and that was stipulating that all fall protection connectors so whether that's the the snap hook that goes on to um, a piece of truss that we're using we're using a Y lanyard or a SRL the yo-yos we clip into um, or a carabiner should have a gate that's rated for 16 kilonewtons or more um, so one of the things that's really interesting to, to learn is that prior to the standard coming out the, it said that around 160 kilos, 1.6 kilonewtons of force was the all it needed to take the gate. And this is different than, because when I talk about this mostly, people 
talk about a carabiner and they say, oh, no, no, my carabiner has three numbers on it. And one of those numbers is cross-loading. That's the gate strength. That's not the gate strength. That's if you pull it in that direction. So the 16 kilonewtons or 3,600 pounds is if you side load this gate in any direction possible, effectively it means that the, the weakest in any way that you can put this carabiner is going to be 16 kilonewtons. That means that you can effectively put it over an edge and fall on it, and it still should be able to take 16 kilonewtons of force. So why is this important? Because in the best case scenario, when we fall, everything is lined up perfectly. Um, chances are, though, if we fall, things aren't going perfectly, are they? Um, if, thing, if we fall, things are usually, all your plans are going out the window. Um, and what we want to do is to make sure that we're giving ourselves the best chance possible to be able to go home at the end of the day. So I'm going to give you guys a trigger warning. Uh, I don't know how many people are easily offended, but this has the potential to do that. Side-loaded carabiners. Um, this picture on the right is what we see often with people going in and out of tension um, in situations where we've got different types of connectors. Um, the one on the right, uh, sorry, the one on the left, sorry, is a, is a non-rated gate in a situation where it can be side-loaded. The one on the right is a carabiner that's being cross-loaded. So I'm not going to get too much into the standards, um, but we all should know that what we want to keep our um, minimum, our, the maximum force that our body should want to be seeing with our fall protection is about six kilonewtons in New Zealand. Um, it's going to be a little bit different in different situations, but that's really what the standard says. Um, so what we want is that everything that we're flipping into should be much, much stronger than that. But at the least, that's what we're expecting. The maximum force to be seen on our gear should be about six kilonewtons. Um, so this carabiner up here with a gate that we don't know the rating of it because Petzl, in this example, we quite like Petzl gear. Petzl don't have to tell us what the gate rating is. They're going to give us three ratings. They're going to give us a open, a that direction, and that direction, but they're not telling us what load that gate has to take um, because they don't need to tell us that. There's been no reason to. Until now, where they've implemented the standard, and it means that <clears throat> we've got a gate that we know if we fall on this picture on the left is going to at least be as strong as 16 kilonewtons, and same with the one on the right. So what that shows is even if we use that piece of gear, in the worst, worst way possible, um, that we're going to be in a, we're going to be have a piece of gear above us that's going to save us. So, a little analogy that I thought was quite cute was I watch a bit of Formula One. Um, Formula One's a really high stress environment, and there's a whole team behind the driver, and the good teams, re the good drivers really acknowledge how important it is to have a good team behind them. So I think of fall protection as the whole team, we're the driver. Um, Lewis Hamilton, who's very many times world champion, recently lost a race because of a really, really simple mistake. Um, he pushed the button on the back of the steering wheel, which changed some settings. Um, and it meant that he ended up losing that race during a restart. It was his fault that he pushed the button. But what happened there were his engineers came and said, we failed because we made it so that he could push that button. They had full accountability of what they could do to make things different. Um, their goal is to make it as hard as possible for Lewis to make a mistake like that. And so for me, we want to make it as hard as possible for people to use their fall protection badly. We want to make it as easy as possible for them to use it well or for it to save them. So this is one of the ways we can do that. So what I encourage people is if they are purchasing fall protection equipment now is to start future-proofing yourself because this isn't the standard in New Zealand now, but it's going to be eventually. Um, so if you're buying gear for yourself or your team, start looking for um, fall protection equipment with a rated gate on it. It's going to make life safer for you and your teams uh, if you do fall. Why, why ASNZS annoys me? <clears throat> 
this is one of the images that's in their uh, in their document. The, the document is a pain in the ass to read. It's uh, expensive, and I probably shouldn't be sharing this picture. So don't snitch on me. Um, the bridle at the top. This is a this is one of the examples in their um, in in the standard. So they're saying you can make a bridle up here. Everyone I hope knows what a bridle is. Um, the angle shouldn't exceed 120 degrees. But then they're showing that this can be done into a carabiner like is down the bottom. So we all know what happens when you pull a carabiner apart like that. We start side loading it. And if we start side loading it like that, there's a bunch of really good videos online that will show what happens when you side load a open the, the wide end of the carabiner. Um, one of the interesting things is that there's a really good YouTube channel called How Not to Highline. Um, and they do a bunch of really, really interesting tests. Uh, one of the things that they've shown is that if you're going to be doing a bridle or pulling pulling the ends of a carabiner apart, it's better to put the bridle end into the narrow end, not the big end if it's two hard points, because it's stronger at that end. I'm not going to get into that. We don't really have time, but it's a really curious thing. So this is just one of the examples of why th that standard is old school and we can do better than it. Um, that's just, yeah, one of them. It's behind the times, so we should look to where is being more stringent around the world and, uh, and measure ourselves against that. That way we can lead the way. Cow's tails and why not to use them? Okay, this is a very, very busy slide, but one of the things we want to do is keep our maximum uh, force that we see is under six kilonewtons. Um, people talk about cow's tails and using them in a situation where they're not going to fall um, more than 600 mils. Uh, it's very rare that that's going to happen. This is a document that was, uh, you can see on the right, series of tests on cow tails used for progression on semi-static ropes, done in 2006. What it shows that is in the best case scenario, if you really, really use it right and you've not put any tension in those cow's tail knots before, because the knots, when you fall, absorb energy, um, is that your forces will stay just under six kilonewtons. Okay, and that's the best case situation. If you've loaded those knots up at all, if you look down the bottom of that table, you see the forces go up above eight, seven, six, seven, eight kilonewtons. Um, so that's a factor one fall on a 60 centimeter cow's tail. So that's falling, you know, 60, well, yeah, 60 centimeters, sorry. Um, if you take it into a factor two fall, we're starting to get up to, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12, even 13 on some of the other um, examples. So this is a reason to not use cow's tails for fall protection um, while you're climbing truss and, and things like that. Is that to say it's not good for the rope access world? No, it's great. Rope access guys use them all the time, but there's a bunch of other factors and a bunch of other training that go, takes into account why a cow's tail is useful in uh, rope access. But most of the time when we're using, people are using them in the entertainment industry for fall protection, they're not using them in a rope access type situation. They're using them as a replacement for a shock absorbing lanyard. So. One of the things that I, it's one of my pet peeves is people saying, oh yeah, but I'm not going to be in a position where I'm going to fall. I'm going to use it as full restraint. Um, to be fully in full restraint while climbing all of the time is a really, really difficult thing to do. Uh, and I've not seen anyone do it properly that's been able to work efficiently. There's better options out there. So it's time that we started to use them. Um, What's happening in the fall protection industry in New Zealand? And where does the entertainment industry sit? So my opinion is that New Zealand is falling behind in fall protection. Um, the standards are pretty low and behind the rest of the world. They're pretty vague and contradictory in many instances. Uh, and they're also painful to read, as well as being incredibly expensive for ridiculously small documents. Um, that's just all part and parcel of it. Um, do I think that everyone should have a, a copy of the standard? No, it's not necessary to buy it. I wish that uh, WorkSafe and the standards people would do a better job of making um, the information e more easily accessible, uh, but we won't get into that too much. Um, but the entertainment industry is doing good. So what I wanna see in the entertainment industry is that we keep up that momentum and lead the way. Um, we've got the potential to lead by example and, and lead the rest of the height safety world. Um, 
there's generally better gear available. So why do the bare minimum? And that's getting back to those, uh, the rated gates. So now that there is better gear available, I feel like we've got the responsibility to better look after ourselves and the people that are working for us or working with us by giving them the best chance possible. We shouldn't wait for the legislation to tell us how to behave. Um, if we know that there's something better, then waiting is negligent. Um, it's also going to mean in the future, if you wait until it's legislated, that you're going to have to do a really big lump sum uh, purchase of buying and updating all your gear. So once you know about it, and if you haven't known about it prior to now, then it's understandable. But if you do know now, then future-proof yourself by starting to replace that gear now. Um, it's 11 o'clock, so we're at a chance where people, if they'd like to jump off to one of the other presentations, can do so. Um, and if you'd like to stick around for another few minutes, then, uh, then we can go through a few more things and I can answer some questions. Um, harnesses, another big pet peeve of mine. <clears throat> Sam knows I can see him slightly smiling up there. Um, there's different types of harnesses. The first thing, often people, there's two types of people, people that want to wear a harness and people that don't want to wear a harness. Um, so how are we going to get them to wear one? There's different types of harnesses. There's full protection harnesses, so the one on the right, the green one, uh, and then there's more the rope access work positioning type harnesses. One of these harnesses is made specifically for falling into. One of them is made for being in suspension and being in tension with. Um, the full protection harness you can see above my head, how's my pointing, uh, has a strap there between the legs that goes underneath the butt, the sub-pelvic strap. This means that if you fall, uh, when you're clipped into the sternal D-ring, that that strap goes under your butt and transfers all of those forces through to your pelvis. Uh, your pelvis is one of the strongest bones in your body. It's going to give you the best chance possible to, to not be hurt if you fall. Um, one of these harnesses I want to hang about in all day working, and the other is going to give me the best chance of minimizing injuries if I fall. Um, not all work positioning harnesses are made equal either. Uh, one of the things that I see and I get frustrated with is the sternal uh, dorsal D-ring, sorry, the one on your back, not being adjustable. If it's too high, right up high, when you fall, it's going to crush your neck. If it's too low, you'll end up tilting forward. Um, so when you're buying harnesses, you want to look for adjustability. And when you're buying harnesses, you want to try them on. Uh, a lot of people ask me, what's the best harness for such and such? You need to try it on. We've all got body, different body types and they're all going to fit us slightly different. What works good for me is not going to work good for Sam uh, and not going to work good for Sandy Gunn. Um, there's, it's really hard in New Zealand because often we don't have the chance to try them on. But if you really are serious about buying a new harness and try on different people's harnesses of people that you know, um, that's going to mean that you can see which one fits because chances are if it doesn't fit good, it's not going to feel very good when you fall. Uh, so we're going to, we work for that. Question. Can you recommend anyone to do training relevant to our industry? Um, Kevin Green, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, there's all of the Safe Working at Heights courses are they're mostly good. They're going to give you a good rundown of what needs to be met legislatively. Um, is there anything entertainment specific? Not at the moment. Um, it's a tough one and something that we talk about a lot. Uh, Sam and I have talked about it until the cows have come home. Uh, and it's you know something that we've, we've joked about doing more of in the future. I know uh, Jen Poppy, who's uh, on the ETNZ, or the ETNZ admin person, has recently started teaching fall protection. So finding places like that with people who work in the industry, who understand our reality, um, is a really important part of, uh, a part of finding training providers. Um, if the training provider mostly does training for people who work um, in scaffolding, then they're not going to really understand so much the reality of working in the entertainment industry. Um, if you're developing a relationship with a tra training provider, invite them along to see the reality of where you're working. Um, by educating those training providers, it means that they're going to be a better position to, um, 
to be able to provide training that's relevant to you. Hope that answers your question. Um, what gear should I buy? <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to think about how many more slides I'll go through because I can talk for hours about fall protection. <laughs> what gear should I buy? We've got to remember what, what are you going to use it for? So is it going to be for fall protection or is it for people going to be working at heights? Is it going to be for one person or is it going to be for general use amongst people in your company? Um, those are going to, you know, that's the reality. Sometimes a company needs to buy harnesses that you know, 10 people are going to use and they're going to buy five harnesses. So they need to find a range of equipment that's going to be able to tick the boxes for those people. Um, it's a tough one. And, and maybe it's a question that you need to bring someone in to talk about uh, with that or find someone experienced to talk about with that. It's a tough, it's a tough situation. Um, how proficient is the user? Giving a person who's not very comfortable working at height all of the best, shiniest, most complicated gear is going to make it overwhelming for them. Um, but also making sure that when you've got people climbing, uh, you've got teams of people climbing, putting a proficient and a, a newbie together is going to give you a chance to help educate the person who's new. Um, unfortunately, the, another constraint for purchasing equipment is what's the budget? I mean, the range of prices for harnesses goes between you know, a couple of hundred dollars to six or seven hundred dollars. Um, and it's a really hard one if the company's having to shell out for, you know, another 10 harnesses because the harnesses have come to the end of their life. But it's definitely a real, a real constraint. Uh, there's no short answer for any of these questions, but they're all questions you should be asking. Um, and there's always people around to answer those questions. I mean, I definitely know that Sam's open to answering questions like that. And I'm always open to talking about fall protection with anyone. Um, I'm very passionate about making sure people can go home at the end of the day. Um, there's always a way that you can work safely. It's just having a think about it. Um, I think I almost probably should cut this one short. The original, the original uh, presentation I was gonna do was gonna break down what happens when you fall and talk about it. But this is what we should think about when we're climbing, when we're working at height. First thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna go, oh shit, we're falling. I've made this slide because I just really wanted to have uh, Ricky on my PowerPoint. Shit just got real when you fall. <clears throat> if you're falling, it means plan A didn't work. So plan B is your fall protection. So everything you did now is gonna determine whether or not uh, your fall protection is going to work properly, not to mention what's below you. Um, so we're already well over time, so I'd like to answer some questions if people would like to ask them. Um, please don't be shy. Uh, I'll try my best to, to make them uh, clear and accessible. My slides go on for another 15 slides, so I don't think we've definitely got time to get through them. Anyone got any questions that I haven't that asked? That was choice, Nick. Thank you. There was a question there from Kevin, which um, which uh, sort of alluded to your original pet. Oh, what's, what's the lifespan of a harness? Well, good question. Uh, depends on the manufacturer. Uh, most of them are around up to 10 years these days. So, you know, when I said earlier about one of my pet, pet peeves was, um, let's say a, a company is selling a harness for $500 that's been sitting on the shelf for a year and a half or two years, do you think it's fair to sell that harness for $500 anymore or should they be selling it for less time? So that's one of the things that I was alluding to with my one of my pet peeves. Um, and it should be the responsibility of the of the people who are selling it to, to do their due diligence and, and look after the people that are buying from them. But also as a, an end user, you guys can understand that and ask those questions of them. Um, if they get grumbly about that, then that's probably a sign that they're more interested in making money than looking after the people. So um, that's definitely one. So one of the things recently that, I mean, Petzl, for example, have been doing is they've changed the rules for their hardware to lifespan wise to be until fails inspection. Um, and harnesses are, are now, I believe, 10 years. So what they were finding was that um, the gear was fine, but because they'd put in this 10 year life on their hardware and five years on their harnesses, people were throwing away perfectly good harnesses. Um, that's one manufacturer and you should always 
look up and see what the manufacturer of your equipment is saying. But it was a nice sign from them that they were trying to be uh, a bit more realistic with not throwing away uh, good gear. So again, look at the instructions. The instructions are out there and there's so much good information in them. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Craig, uh, from Ben Williams. Any thoughts on whether annual harness inspection should be done by someone other than the user, i.e. sending it off to aspiring or cooks? So this is a good one. Yeah, I think that every year you should get someone else to look at your harness. Um, it used to be my job when I went around teaching fall protection and rescue at Cirque was that I'd spend one day going through all of the equipment, logging it and, uh, and inspecting it. One of the most boring things you could do not the inspection part, but the part that sucks the most is writing down serial numbers. Um, and with the amount of connectivity that's available these days, the it's going to make it easier to do an RFID tag scan or a QR code scan. But it's always good to get someone else to look at your gear once a year. Um, who should do it? Could it be in the company? It could be if there's a person trained in the company. A lot of it comes down to liability. Um, by sending it off to get inspected means that a, a company specifically isn't liable if there is a problem with the harness. Uh, very rarely are there problems with harnesses when people fall, but it's still something that a company who is going to have to, you know, go down the rabbit hole if something were to happen uh, is going to try and, I don't want to say cover their ass, but I'm going to say cover their ass with. Um, for subcontractors, Maybe it's finding someone else that's competent or a qualified person, and by qualified I mean has the relevant experience um, to do it and documenting that. Um, if you get into who's allowed to do inspections of gear in New Zealand, it is the standard is, I think it does talk about qualified people in the sense of someone who's experienced. They aren't stipulating a qualification, although there is a qualification out there for inspecting gear. Um, but another, this is another situation where standards and qualifications don't necessarily line up. Um, it's good to get people to check your gear, whether it's uh, cross-checking stuff when you're doing load calculations, uh, setting up complicated acrobatic uh, rigging, or um, checking your harness is okay once a year. Get, to get, get together with your buddies, check your, check your gear together. It's an easy thing to do, and then document it. Uh, most companies have an uh, inspection sheet available for their harnesses, for example. So you can download that and do the inspection with it, document the things that you might be concerned about, take photos. There's always ways to do it. And it sort of comes back in some ways, Nick, to your original opening is, you know, don't be a dick, don't be lazy. You know, that peer review and, and being open to feedback and is a really big, big part of our industry um, that is lacking, is, is opening ourselves up to, to feedback. It, it can be hard to hear at times, but it's important to do. It helps us all do the job better and, and deliver a safer product. Yeah. yeah. Um, any more questions anyone has? Making, making me talk about fall protection for only half an hour, obviously, is near impossible because it's been well over that now. Um, there's always a way to do things safely. Uh, sometimes it takes more time and sometimes it takes more thought. Um, so please, if you have any concerns or comments, know that there's people out there that you can talk to about it. Um, I've had many phone calls and text messages and photos sent to me over the years of people that are concerned about things. And I'm always open for that. So if anyone ever has any questions, please reach out. Uh, my big thing is people are not paid enough to not go home at the end of the day. So we want to make things safe and, and efficient for people. Um, the safer we are, the more we can justify charging uh, fair rates to what we do. Um, it's, you know, that's one thing that's really important as well. Um, let's see any more questions. Sam, do you have any questions? No, I don't. I just saw that. Uh 
comment from Ben that you should host you should host a, a gear demo day somewhere in Welling Welling. Uh, look, Nick does work for a um, for a company that supplies equipment as well. So if you are wanting to get to have a little play with some kit, get in touch with them. Um, you know, he's super approachable. He does have some good resources available. Um, and yeah, you know, and he's always, from my experience, always incredibly willing to share both his knowledge and his and his playtime. Um, so yeah, definitely you know, get in touch. Um, yeah, don't don't yeah don't hesitate. He's a he's a super a super awesome chap and approachable. So yeah. um, but we'll probably we'll probably wrap it up at that point, Nick. And I appreciate you being able to squash as much as you did into your session. Um, and yeah, like carry on the conversations both around the team, everyone, and and get in touch with people like Nick um so thank you very much for your presentation um cool. and a reminder to everyone who's uh, who's been watching this one um we've got insights from returning global industry practitioners is underway as we speak over in stream b so yeah jump over there and catch up with them and thanks again nick thanks buddy take care guys look after each other